and the Dean of Harvard Cancer Institute, Associate Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School, and Associate Professor at Harvard, at Harvard School of Public Health, and a staff writer at the New, York, New Yorker Magazine. He served as a Senior Health Policy Advisor in the Clinton Presidential Campaign in the White House. Dr. Gawande has published research studies in areas ranging from surgical technique to U.S. military care for the wounded to error performance in medicine. He is the director of the World Health Organization's Global Challenge for Safer Surgical Care. In 2006, he received the MacArthur Award for his research and writing. Indeed, his writings have touched us all. His newest book, The Checklist Manifesto, is a New York Times bestseller. However, despite his many impressive public accolades, the real reason we chose Dr. Gawande to be our class day speaker is his history of being an inspiring teacher, mentor, and friend of his students. It is our great privilege to have Dr. Gawande here with us today. And please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Retirement 
from a surgical practice in Ohio. The greatest leap for him, he tells me, wasn't in taking that first step off the plane in New York City, extraordinary as that was. Instead, it was in going from his rural farming village of 5,000 people to Nakhor, a city of millions, where he was admitted to medical school 300 kilometers away. Both communities were impoverished, but the structure of life, the values, and the ideas were so different as to be unrecognizable. Visiting back home, he found that one generation couldn't even grasp the challenges of the other. Here is where we seem to find ourselves as well. We are at a cusp point in medical generations. The doctors of former generations lament what medicine has become. If they could start over, the surveys tell us they wouldn't choose the profession today. They recall a simpler past without insurance company hassles, government regulations, malpractice litigation, not to mention nurses and doctors bearing tattoos and talking of wanting balance in their lives. These are not the cause of their unease, however. They're symptoms of a deeper condition, which is the reality that medicine's complexity has exceeded our individual capabilities as doctors. The core structure of medicine, how healthcare is organized and practiced, emerged in an era when doctors could hold all of the information patients needed in their heads and manage everything required themselves. One needed only an ethic of hard work, a prescription pad, a secretary in the hospital willing to serve as one's workshop, loaning a bed and nurses for a patient's convalescence, maybe an operating room with a few basic tools. We were craftsmen. We could set the fractures, spin the blood, plate the cultures, administer the anti -serum. The nature of the knowledge lent itself to prizing autonomy, independence, and self-sufficiency among our highest values, and to designing medicine accordingly. You can't hold all the information in your head anymore. And you can't master all the skills. No one person can work up a patient's back pain, run the immunoassay, do the physical therapy, protocol the MRI, and direct the treatment of the unexpected cancer that I'm growing in the spine. I don't even know what it means to protocol the MRI. Before Elias Zerhouni became director of the National Institutes of Health, he was a senior hospital leader at Johns Hopkins. And he once calculated how many clinical staff were involved in the care of their typical hospital patient, how many doctors and nurses and so on. In 1970, he found it was 2.5 full-time equivalents, 2.5 full-time people. By the end of the 1990s, it was more than 15. The number must be even larger today. Everyone has just a piece of patient care. We're all specialists now, even the primary care doctors. A structure that prioritizes the independence of all of those specialists will have enormous difficulty achieving great care. We don't have to look far for the evidence two million patients pick up infections in American hospitals, most because someone didn't follow basic antiseptic precautions. 40% of coronary disease patients and 60% of asthma patients receive incomplete or inappropriate care. And half of major surgical complications are avoidable with existing knowledge. It's like no one's in charge, because sometimes no one is. The public's experience is that they have amazing clinicians and technologies, with little consistent sense that they come together to provide an actual system of care from start to finish with we train, hire, and pay doctors to be cowboys. But it's pit crews that patients need. Another sign this is the case is the unsustainable cost of healthcare. Medical performance tends to follow a bell curve with a wide gap between the best results and the worst results for a different condition, depending on where people go for their care. And the costs follow a bell curve as well, varying for similar patients by as much as 30 to 50 percent. But the interesting thing is that the curves do not match. The places that get the best results are not the most expensive places. 
Indeed, many are among the least expensive. And this means there is hope. For if the best results required the highest costs, then rationing care would be our only choice. Instead, however, we can look to the top performers, the positive deviants, to understand how to provide the society most needs better care at lower cost. And the pattern seems to be that the places that function most like a system are most successful. By a system, I mean that the diverse people actually work together to direct the specialized capabilities they have toward common goals for patients. The way you have as medical students working together for the last few years. These people would be coordinated by design. They'd be pit crews. To function this way, however, you must cultivate certain skills uncommon in practice and not often taught. For one, you must acquire an ability to recognize when you've succeeded and when you've failed for patients. People in effective systems become interested in data. They put effort and resources into collecting them, refining them, and understanding what they say about their performance. Second, you must grow an ability to devise solutions for the system's problems that data and experience uncover. When I was in medical school, for instance, one of the last ways I'd imagined spending time in my future surgical career would have been working on things like checklists, robots, and surgical techniques, sure. Information technology, maybe, but checklists? They turn out, however, to be among the most basic tools of the quality and productivity revolution in aviation and engineering and construction in virtually every field where they combine high risk and high complexity. Checklists seem lowly and simplistic, but they help fill in for the gaps in our brains and between all of our brains. They emphasize group precision and execution, and making them in medicine has forced us to define our key aims for our patients and say exactly what we're going to do to help achieve them. Making teams successful is more difficult than we knew. Even the simplest checklist forces us to grapple with vulnerabilities like handoffs between people and even checklist overload. But designed well, the results are turning out to be extraordinary, allowing us to eliminate many hospital infections, the deaths and surgery by as much as half globally, and slash costs as well. Which brings us to the third skill you must have that have been taught. The ability to implement at scale. The ability to get your colleagues along the entire chain of care functioning like pit crews for patients. There is resistance, sometimes human resistance, to the efforts that make it possible. Partly it's because the work is rooted in different values than the ones we have. They include humility and understanding that no matter who you are, how experienced or smart, you will fail along the way. The values include discipline, belief that standardization, doing certain things the same way every time, and reduce your failure. And they include teamwork, the recognition that others can save you from failure no matter who they are in the hierarchy. These values are the opposite of autonomy.